So broadly, there are two ways of having a Krishna consciousness vision. And one is to see how Krishna is present in something. And the other is to see how Krishna is absent in something. Now we may say, how can seeing how Krishna is absent be a Krishna conscious vision? Yes, it is. We are conscious that there is no Krishna over here. Otherwise, we may just get caught in the material world and may forget that we have forgotten Krishna. So, in that sense, it is good to separate, okay, right now I am in a devotional association, I am right now in a non-devotional association. Because we want to stay connected with Krishna. It's just like if we have any relation, if I have a relationship, you know, if we are married, then if we are talking with uh, a man or a woman who is other than our husband or wife, you know, as a duty we may talk, but there is a boundary over there, we are aware. So, like that for a devotee, there is a boundary when a devotee is not in a devotional setting. Now, of course, just as we have to interact with different people at different times for the purpose of functioning in the world, similarly, as devotees, we cannot always stay in devotional settings. We do have to go outside of devotional settings. So, another way, to, so the point is, generally, it is very easy if we in the early season of our bhakti to say that okay this is a deviation this is not what is real this is wrong this is less intelligent this is impersonalist as devotees it is easy to look at krishna consciousness in a very black and white way that this is krishna consciousness this is bona fide this is not however much of reality exists as they say the muddle in the middle you know, this is shades of grey. So, in the shades of grey, it is for us to see how we can see Krishna consciousness. Now, what does this mean? When we talk about Diwali, we generally celebrate, for us it is Damodar and we offer the lamb to the Lord. And we have Govardhan Puja. Generally, as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we focus on these two main occasions during the celebration of Diwali but in the broader cultural context Diwali has many other stories and significances associated with them so what we will try to do in this two series of classes is what other stories are there what significance is there to the stories how we can see it from a Krishna conscious perspective so rather than saying you know this is this is a devta worship or this is this, this is that. We don't celebrate that. Yes, that is true. But we can look at it from a Krishna conscious perspective. And we can see how some aspect of Krishna is present even within those festivities. And <clears throat> the idea here is that the Bhagavad Gita is meant to give us Shastra Chakshu. Hmm? That the capacity to see the whole world with Krishna consciousness and to, that means we can look at mundane things also to see how they are related with Krishna then something we could say these are like instead of seeing it as one zero they are concentric circles the circle of pure devotional service there is a circle of devotional service there is a circle of circle of say mundane piety there is a circle of sattva guna there is a circle of material ambition and there is a circle down there is a circle say of down the right of tamoguna so rather than seeing this as one zero so we can have pure devotional service then we have devotional service then we have piety piety means people are doing yagya dana tapa they are doing some good activities then people may have sattva some sattvic concerns people may have now there might be something which is in Rajas and there might be something which is in Tamas. So, for example, Bhaktivinoda Thakur in his Chaitanya Shikshamrat talks about different kinds of festivals. So, he says there are Vaishnava festivals, there are Vedic festivals and there are general festivals. 
so general festivals you may say that that say at that time british rule was there in india so the queen's birthday was a big celebration at that time general festivals he talks sort of vedic festivals he talks about durga puja over there so he says he gives an analysis of how devotees can look at these various festivals should devotees participate if they participate in what consciousness do we participate so so piety could mean if say one of the pujas over here is lakshmi puja we'll talk about that so there is some level of piety there may not be exactly bhakti over there but some punya is there over there in the sense that there is a blessing being sought from something higher now satvik festivals could be something like just a month or so ago there was the world mental health day the suicide prevention day now these this is nothing to celebrate in that yeah there is not celebrate but it is commemorate so in you know, something of significance so we'll start from a very broad perspective and then we'll come towards diwali specifically from a gaudiya vaishnav perspective so as devotees we don't have to see something this is this is this is authentic this is deviant rather we can see okay this is more connectable with krishna this is less connectable with krishna as we need to have a more krishna centered vision and see how everything can be connected with krishna <coughs> since 2014 i have been spending almost more than half of the year 8 9 year, months a year out of india doing outreach in the west and that has considerably expanded my perspectives so in the western world often they associate indian festivals the first thing that comes in their mind is the festival of lights that is diwali now of course two other festivals are becoming common and i would say both of them are largely because of uh, the krishna conscious movement one is the festival of chariots so what is that rath yatra it's becoming very big in the western world and then there is also the festival of colors that is holy so now when people come lot of people participate in these festivals and they may have different degrees of understanding so i'll start generically so this is a broad vision that we will try to see how much can something be connected with krishna rather than dismissing something this is just mundane and we don't celebrate it so how much can we connect things with krishna so generally when people celebrate any occasion they celebrate some festivals broadly the motives for celebrating any kind of for celebrations mm. i'm talking not just okay india won the cricket match and we're celebrating our party won the elections i'm not talking about those kind of celebrations i'm talking more about celebrations in terms of some festivals so in the broad vedic tradition there is a saying manava utsava priya that people generally like celebration like festivals so broadly speaking there could be two three levels one is that festivals help people to break the monotony of life monotony of life means what that actually if we tell people this world is dukhale most people say no they are being too pessimistic it's uh, to say that this is a place of distress that's a overstatement well yes and no you know distress itself can range over a spectrum and most of life may not be distressful in the sense of being devastating see devastating means what we get is the opposite of our desires so this is extremely painful so for example we work very hard to get a job and then we get the job and in the job there is some terrible office politics and instead of that dream job it turns out to be a nightmare where we are framed for some crime which we are not committed at all so that is a extreme distress and it can happen we go for some outing and instead of having fun we slip and fall and we get a fracture now things like this when things happen opposite to what we expected so we wanted things to be in one direction but what happens is completely in the opposite direction 
so most people associate dukha with this and such things happen but this is not what normally happens life in general is not devastating but it is disappointing disappointing means what what we expected was this much and what we got was this much it like life does not live up to our expectations we can't say things are bad but things are not as good as we want hope wanted them to be as we hope them to be so and this is also painful it's and sometimes even the disappointing can be devastating for someone say there's a competition and say somebody wanted to come first and they came second now considering there are maybe 100 competitors coming second is not a bad thing but what happens is the human psychology is such that you know when there if there are three winners you know there's a gold silver and bronze the first prize winner is happy the third prize winner is happy the second prize winner is miserable <laughs> why is that the first prize winner oh i got the first the third i got something at least <laughs> but the second what happens oh i didn't get the first so they are disappointed what in the vision see what happens is that in the reference point okay in the picture i am at least there so third is happy in the picture i am the best the first is happy but one who is second okay, i am nowhere there you know <laughs> i why was i not the first so when life turns out to be disappointing a more common word for it is when life is repeatedly disappointing when it is repeatedly means one thing disappoints us another thing disappoints us another thing disappoints us we expect a feast and the food is such that we prefer we should have fasted <laughs> then when it is repeatedly disappointing then life starts becoming boring mm -hmm. so boredom is a common problem where what is happening is it's not that we are in distress but again and again things are not as good as we wanted them to be and then we just start losing hope that things will become better and this is when people try to seek escape through entertainment and things like that but the idea is life in general can be boring so there is a routine and we we are required to do the routine responsibilities we have the daily grind as they say where we have to do this and we have to do that so their festivals give us a break from the monotony of life or oh, there is something different i can do today there is something different i am meant to do and that is why even people who may not believe in god people who do not people who are completely secular they also create festivals of some kind or the other hmm. there is a one popular book in europe not very popular but it's a fairly widely read book it is called religion for atheists <laughs> because europe in many ways was like the headquarters for atheism see from the indian perspective we think of the west as materialistic and that means we think of america and america we equate with hollywood however america is the most religious country in the western world the southern part of america is all quite evangelical christian and they were fairly religious so as compared to that you, religion is dying much faster in europe of course there is some revival happening because there is so much islamic immigration so islam is rising christianity is dying islam is rising in the west but the point is that there were many social critics secular social critics they said that that god is dead and religion is going to die soon but they have found that religion is resilient it continues living so now they started realizing that the activities that are done in the name of religion they serve a psychological need for people even if philosophically there is no such thing as god psychologically the activity of coming together doing some communal activities doing some service doing some singing doing some commune communal communal not in india we use the word communal in the sense of communal violence but communal is a adjective for community so doing some activities as a community that is important 
So that if you just Google and search festivals for atheists, they've created a whole set of festivals, and this is basically they will have they will have songs. When the French Revolution was there, that was one of the most aggressively atheistic political revolution in the world. So just killed everything, destroyed everything associated with religion. But soon the cathedral Notre Dame, which was there in uh, France, they they re renamed as a temple of reason, and we'll worship the goddess of reason, like science is based on reason. So the point is, people need something to celebrate. So it is meant to break the monotony of life. And if we appreciate this, then even if somebody may not be devotionally minded, still they can participate in festivals, because it's something different. Like when devotees go out as Hari Nam Kirtan. Somebody may not have any idea of what is God, but still they come and they join. It's just something enjoyable. So people participate in festivals. And <coughs> in India, uh, uh, we'll see when people go to the different parts of the world. So often nowadays we live in a multicultural society. So Indians may also celebrate something like Halloween and Christmas and other things, but because it's just a part of the culture and it, it breaks the monotony of life, it helps people to bond with each other. So we'll talk about this a little later, but that's one purpose. The second purpose is meaning. Meaning means that our daily life, the daily grind is so monotonous, so mechanical, but still there are so many things which keep coming in our lives. There are, as we say, urgent but not important. So festivals often remind us of what is really important. Say for example, um, in Diwali, many people, the families come together. And now God may not be very prominent in their consciousness and it might just be some ritual that they do at the end of the day. But what happens is, okay, we are so law, we are so disconnected from each other that okay, what is important? Relationships are important. Bonding is important. So that there can be devotional meaning and we'll come to that. But things that matter, festivals help us remember what is, what is truly meaningful in our life. And some celebrations that we do, they remind us of what is meaningful. So for example, there is India's Independence Day or the Republic Day. So these are days that are meant to remind us that there were previous generations who fought for the political independence that we have. Now we may say political independence is mundane. Yes, it may be mundane, but still it has given us some freedom by which we can practice our faith. So I was talking with one devotee who works in communications in UK and he was telling that in Brit I mean, among the various countries in the world, Britain is the country where our movement is the most influential. Now, Britain has a significant, especially England specifically, uh, England has a significant uh, Hindu diaspora. Diaspora is basically the immigrants who go and settle over there. And we as a movement often represent the voice of Hinduism over there. So, so he was telling me that he was invited, the, pre the president earlier of the London Temple, he told me, I was invited to the London House of Commons on the occasion of Diwali. And he, they told me that the British Prime John Major was the Prime Minister over there. There the Prime Minister and everyone was there. And they told me, speak for about two, three minutes about the significance of Diwali. Now, he was telling me that in two, three minutes, I cannot tell the story of Rao, I cannot tell the story of Govardhan. We tell the start, the, st the stories, that stories will raise more questions than answers. You know, so you just imagine you go to a completely secular audience, not even Indian politicians, at least they have some idea of what Indian religious traditions are. But in the West, you go, you know, there is a mountain and we worship that mountain with a mountain of food. You know, there will be only a mountain of confusion in people's minds. <laughs> so, there's Srila Prabhupada, he says in one lecture, that you know whatever is our message hmm, 
he is especially he's talking talking in, in one lecture also in one conversation with with the scientists who were uh, a part of the bhakti vedanta institute he said we should be able to explain our message both based on scripture and based on logic so prabhupada was saying that if you are going to talk with scientifically minded people quoting shastra is not going to bring credibility for them so the idea about the existence of god the existence of of the soul we cannot just quote shastra he said that we should be able to explain this based on logic also so we could say that similarly you know we have our festivals or our our rituals or in general our practices so we need to be able to explain to them in a confidential way we could say based on scripture confidential means what that it is more insider explanation it is for those whom we can take into confidence those who already know about scripture but for so we could simply use the word insider for this so but we need to also be able to explain it in a universal way that is what we can say for outsiders so if a person does not know anything about the whole uh, maybe the religious background or the historical significance then uh, what is the significance of diwali say you know i need one hour to explain now i am taking one hour to explain but i am taking one hour to explain how you can explain one minute <laughs> not like that but that we should be able to explain briefly and if people are interested we can explain more in detail so the idea is there there is a <clears throat> so generally the confidential explanations the confidential or insider explanations these will tend to be more specific specific means what that they talk about specific stories specific characters specific incidents whereas the universal will be more symbolic symbolic means what does it signify so <coughs> so the sashruti dharma prabhu is the leader of lanna he told me that when he went to the house of commons he said that diwali as you may have seen is celebrated with lights being lit so in our tradition light signifies goodness light signifies virtue light signifies wisdom and the lighting of those lamps signifies the triumph of wisdom over ignorance of good over evil and for us see now this is a national assembly and there they are interested but from their perspective uh, they are concerned uh, that how does your religious tradition relate with what is of importance for us shila prabhupad explains that what does speaking with realization whenever we are speaking speaking with realization what does it mean so he says this is the message of scripture and these are the interests of the audience hmm? so he says that we should be able to speak in a way that is interesting for the audience no unwarranted meaning is to be screwed out but we should be able to speak in a way that is interesting for the audience and finding this intersection between what our message is and what is the interest of the audience that is realization so basically if we consider a speaker the speaker should be aware of scripture and the speaker should be aware of the audience also understanding the audience understanding the needs of the audience say if we go to a university and there's a university one time program and maybe we are invited to speak as a part of the orientation in the first year when the students are coming in and we say okay i will speak on how 
personalism is the actual reality and impersonalism is all wrong and people will say i don't even know what is personalism and impersonalism isn't it so what will happen is we are establishing personalism but we are impersonal with the audience <laughs> because we don't consider the audience interests so maybe if they are there the, the students are having a the, most of them may have come to a hostel it's a new phase of their life there's going to be stress there's going to be anxiety so how can we deal with anxiety what does the bhagavad gita talk about the mind <coughs> what practices can help us to calm our mind so that way we need to be able to explain the significance of our whatever we are teaching in a way that is relevant for the audience so so he said that in our tradition it is very important that we celebrate our various festivals hmm uh freely and joyfully and thus as we celebrate diwali we are also grateful to this great country of uk which has given us the freedom of religion so that we can practice our faith here and we can share all of us can share in this uh, a festivity where we all can long for the triumph of wisdom over ignorance and then it to connected something you know there is bigotry and narrow mindedness and biases and prejudices and hatred that comes because of ignorance let us hope that the political climate will become less divisive and we'll all come together united in wisdom so he told me that after that both the prime minister and the opposition leader they came and said you know we like we appreciated your point about how britain is providing this freedom of religion now it is true there are some countries which do not give that freedom of religion i just came from the middle east and middle east is a remarkable phenomena you know we have more devotees there than anywhere else in the world in many ways at least in the congregation so every program that i was doing like a weekend program that are i was in one country in muscat there are 600 people 700 people 800 people for every program uae but it all has to be underground not underground at least private we cannot do anything publicly the devotees are the people are still enthusiastic and still people are doing it but there is no freedom of the public practice of religion so we can appreciate that so the point i'm making over here is that we need to be able to explain the significance of what we are doing in a way that people can relate with both insiders and outsiders so everybody is looking for some meaning in life and now that such a meaning is there can be like a insider level meaning okay this is a story this is significance but there is a universal level meaning so for example in krishna leela krishna appears at 12 o'clock at night so midnight is a time of darkness and when krishna appears then light comes everywhere so the appearance of krishna is meant to bring the light of hope amid the darkness of despair and distress in our life now this is a symbolic significance now we are not saying the symbolic is the only significance but quite often the symbolic is what people can initially appreciate and from there they move forward to further things so and the last part is mercy that people while going through life sooner or later realize that things are not in my control and i cannot determine the results that i want a uh, few a month or so ago i was invited to speak at three four different organizations isro drdo and a couple of other organizations and after i spoke over there they took me around and it's amazing these are like cutting edge scientific organizations in india and every significant achievement that they aim for like say drdo releases a new missile uh, or isro does a space launch uh, they were showing me how they have their directors or chief leaders they go to tirupati balaji they offer prayers and 
and they also do something religious over here now what I, what happens is especially somebody who's working at the cutting edge of technology especially with respect to en environment and space even scientists who are a little bit honest and humble they understand that there are so many parameters beyond our control you now whether something will succeed or not it's not all in our control so whatever is unknown up there we want to seek the mercy seek the seek the blessings of that so basically <coughs> now in life when we want to talk about philosophy also we can talk about basically there are two options either i am the center of the universe that means i can do whatever i want i am god basically or i i am not god hmm? i am not the center of the universe now it's very easy to understand that i am not the center of the universe that i don't move the planets that i don't control everything now if somebody thinks that i control everything then somebody else has to control them <laughs> such people will go mad they will make the world mad so we are not in we are not the absolute controller that is quite easy to understand then we have only three if i am not in control then the question come who or what is so we have only three options you can use the acronym fan for this that who whatever is in control that is favorable hmm, that is against whoever is in charge is favorable to us who is against us or is neutral to us or here you can have is non existent whichever way you want basically when we function in the world i am here and there is something up there either that thing can be kind to me favorable to me or it can be unfavorable to me or it doesn't care for me at all now the modern science scientific world view it goes in this direction that either there is no god that now science itself is not atheistic technically science is non theistic science does not look for god as an explanation for phenomena science looks for material explanations so in that sense even if god is there like laplace presented his book to the french king and then he was asked so so where is god in your book and he said your highness i have no need for that hypothesis so he said basically his idea was that i can explain this universe without referring to god the science is attempting to do that to whatever extent it may or it may not be successful but the point is science may or may not need god but humans need god see science is largely looking for means okay how can we communicate faster how can we travel faster but we humans are looking for meaning what does it all mean what is the significance of it so basically this world view it is not tenable that although science and technology are increasing more and more people are turning towards a some kind of a religious or a spiritual world view now in the uk there is what they call as the newton tree newton tree is what the tree where under which newton is said to have sat at that time tuck, the apple fell on him and and they said that oh that's how and then newton thought of gravity based on that now it's interesting now that tree is not existing of course but its descendant is existing and many universities across the world actually import that tree and many universities across the world have the newton tree and their idea is that we can go under that tree and just as newton got some brilliant insight you know maybe whatever some higher power higher blessing some people even pray to the tree itself bless me now what is the use of praying to the tree but the idea is that there is something higher up there and we need the help of that something higher 
so the, uh, so in general whenever people celebrate festivals they just want to break the monotony of their life they want they want some meaning or they want to remind themselves of what is important for them and then they are seeking the blessings the mercy of whatever is higher up there so now with this so this is where i'll be focusing on the most of the remaining class today as well as tomorrow that for us it is a religious significance that is important now we may focus more on the specific you know this festival is worshiping krishna this festival is not worshiping krishna and there is some importance to that but the principle that during the routine course of life most people don't really remember god but there are some occasions when people are reminded or those occasions give them an opportunity to remember that there is something higher and when there is something higher let us invoke that let us invoke that higher let us seek blessings of that higher being and so festivals enable us to seek the blessings of that higher reality so there is in america in many places see, <clears throat> what happens is when indians go to america indish initially there's a lot of glamour oh we want to enjoy life we want this we want to have fun and other things but indians are quite responsible with respect to family so once they get married and they have children they want to take care of the children and they want to ensure that we pass on good values to our children so for that purpose there is uh they, they often try to connect with some religious organizations or spiritual organization and lot of organizations going in this way so the idea is that people do feel the need like passing on values to children we understand we can't control our children completely so there is a big way in which now in the west uh, like devotees are doing outreach that is that say when uh, a woman is pregnant see in the west they want to be gender neutral now so they, they, they don't say the woman is pregnant the husband and wife say together we are pregnant now the husband is not pregnant but we are expecting so it's a curious language they use but the idea is that often there are now devotee forums iskon has started it and other hindu groups have started it that when a woman is pregnant at that time you can join some online forum and you can hear the entire ramayana during that time you can hear the entire bhagavatam during that time and they create some forum somebody else reads it out aloud to you you read it out aloud and many people join it because they want auspiciousness for their child and every day if you read one hour 8 9 months you can co- cover a big book actually so this is what there are these times when i'm going to have a child pregnancy can be quite a delivery can be a turbulent affair so many things can go wrong so there can be miscarriage there can be child can be autistic there can be so many issues so people seek some higher intervention so this mercy the festivals remind us that there is something higher in life so i'll talk about the first day of diwali and then i'll stop today so the diwali has many different aspects within it and we will try to discuss as many of them as we can today and tomorrow now uh, one caveat or one clarification here is that that the same incident sometimes there are different stories associated with it in different parts of the world the same incident is seen differently and i'll talk a, a little bit about religious psychology tomorrow but at this point uh, the first day generally is dhanteras they call it now it's interesting how see sometimes we celeb- separate the material and the spiritual don't go to krishna for material desires we should only go to krishna for service but what it is that there is service there is devotional service and then there is pure devotional service so it's a gradual step if people go to god for anything at all that is also good where anya bilashita shunyam is the highest hmm? pure devotional service and we want to go there anya bilashita but before we can come to that it is yena kena prakare na so yena kena prakare somehow or the other come to krishna now one of the most successful christian outreach programs 
in the last five years has been that what happens in Christmas, most people actually in Christmas, they forget Jesus and for them it is all about Santa Claus. Is it Santa Claus? Santa Claus comes and gives gifts. Now in one sense the story of Santa Claus has really very little to do with Jesus. And the same thing I talked about how Krishna is present and how Krishna is absent. So there are some Christian pastors who initially were quite critical of Santa Claus. But then they realize that from a small child's perspective, Santa Claus is much more attractive than Jesus. So what they started doing, and this is such a sweet program, they had, in these kids, you get gifts. You know, somebody gives you gifts. But they started saying that the kids should take the, not just be recipients of Santa Claus gifts, but be distributors of Santa Claus gifts. The kids go to underprivileged areas and give the gifts to other kids who are poorer. And the kids love it, the parents love it. The many people you tell them, you know, you go on this. So, so even people who are non-Christians, they join this. Because everybody would like to make somebody else happy. Isn't it? Go and, if I am not paying money, I am very happy to give a gift to someone. <laughs> Isn't it? So if I don't have to, if somebody just, the church is giving me gifts and go and give it to these people. Now, of course, there are selfish people who steal those gifts also. That's unfortunate. <laughs> but the point is, that these people may have no devotion but still service is there okay i may not be believing jesus but if there is a soup kitchen where food is being served i want to serve the food i know many people many matajis in the west especially they told me that their husbands will not come to temple for hearing a class but if their husband come to drop them after that if prasadam is being served or some volunteer work is required they will be ready to do that so they're not interested in devotional service but they're interested in service so we need to be able to expand the reach, the net of festivals. So with respect to the first, so rather than see separating material welfare and spiritual welfare, oh, we don't want to be material consciousness, we all want to be spiritual consciousness. We can integrate the two. So Dhanteras is associated with two main things. And the first is Dhanvantri. Now we all know the story of Samudra Manthan in the churning of the milk ocean towards the end two things happen the first is that Lakshmi Devi appears towards the end and we'll talk about that later but uh, through uh, Lakshmi, Lakshmi at the end Dhanvantri appears and Dhanvantri gives the pot of nectar so now the specific story is that Dhanvantri gives the nectar that enable that provides immortality. But so there is a specific and there is the symbolic. The symbolic is Dhanvantri is the presiding deity of Ayurveda. And he said that in one hand he brings the nectar, in the other hand, now this is a later tradition, another tradition, that he also brings the first Ayurvedic text. And thus, not just for that time, people can live long. See Ayurveda. What is the Veda to increase Ayu? The knowledge of how we can prolong our life. Not just increase in quantity, but also in quality. So, the symbolic is that he provides wisdom. So, Dhanteras is associated with, <coughs> with Dhanvantri and the blessing of good health. Now, it's interesting how things are co connected together. One of the things it is said at the time festival, clean your house. Make it as clean and tidy and attractive as you can. So now cleanliness is also very helpful for health. You know, hospitals, they may not be clean in the sense of being attractive, but they have to be clean in the sense of being hygienic. So there is this cleanliness that is emphasized and that's part of the celebration. But within the broad religious worldview, now, for somebody, they may be seeking health. Health is one of the things which makes people pray to God quite often. Because even with the best of medicine, sometimes things just don't work. So, Dhanvantri, Dhanteras is the point where health. So, it's almost like what we talk about in Namodar Leela. We seek some higher health, but we also do something ourselves. That we are seeking the blessings of Dhanvantri, but we are cleaning our house. We are keeping things well organized and tidy and clean. And then while Lakshmi Devi appears earlier and we have that occasion of you know, when Lakshmi Devi appears to the churning of the milk ocean, 
then she looks around and she sees who is a worthy bride for me and after looking at everyone she finds everyone deficient in something except one person who is that lord vishnu so then she offers her varamala her garland to lord vishnu now now it is described that after this there is the lakshmi she formally accepts vishnu now nowadays we will we'll talk about lakshmi puja and the role of wealth tomorrow but the idea is after dhanteras comes lakshmi puja and prabhupada would often say that we should not be worshiping lakshmi separate from narayan the separate from vishnu but how that originated and how that can be understood that we'll discuss but the idea is that in this world everybody looks for health and everybody looks for wealth these are two fundamental necessities for survival now that after we survive then we can look at why we are surviving isn't it am i living for materialistic purposes am i living for spiritual purposes so the idea is the beginning of diwali itself is reminding us that the fundamental resources that we need for surviving they are actually not dependent on us alone there are higher blessings that we need so in the overall hierarchy there are things which have survival value this is a term which comes in uh, evolution also the survival of the fittest so if some living being has some adaptation some ability which is better than other they have survival value so first there is survival value this is generally material things but after that comes value for survival so okay i want to survive but after surviving what will bring value to not for to survival if i live what will first i want to be alive and then i want to have a life worth living that life should have some meaning some deeper deeper significance and that will come later but the significance of health and wealth that is the fundamental resources so health and wealth these are what are fundamental requirements for living and they are provided for by factors beyond our control and the very onset of diwali reminds us of this now literally the word diwali means the deepavali it is also called deepa is lamps and avali is either a line a series or a sequence so padyavali that is a poetic composition a composition of verses so deepavali is a is not so much a sequence as a series a line in which a uh, lamps are lit so one level of the lighting of the lamp is that we become aware that the things that we need for our survival are not in our control entirely even to survive in this world we need factors beyond us and being reminded of those realities brings a certain level of humility a certain level of perspective for our living so i'll summarize what we discussed today in the significance of diwali i spoke mainly three points the first was that <clears throat> how so how is how are we approaching this we said that whenever we explain things we can explain in the insider way that is more confidential for those who are familiar with the tradition but this will involve things which are more specific but we also should be able to explain in an outsider way which is more universal more symbolic that everybody should be able to relate with things and prabhupada also said that explain with scripture but also explain with logic so give the example of how diwali if we are in the west and you to explain we cannot tell a whole story he say that signifies the triumph of wisdom over ignorance or good over bad and the light signifies that so in that connection we discuss also about how when we are trying to explain explaining speaking with realization means understanding what is the message of scripture and what is the interest of the audience and then finding the intersection between the two of them so that we can explain then i talked about 
three broad levels at which we can make sense of festivals. So why are festivals celebrated? At the first level it is to break the monotony of life. Life becomes monotonous, every day we have to do the same thing. <coughs> and when we use the word Dukkha and Dukkhalayam, it does not necessarily mean life has to be devastating in the sense of things going the opposite of what we wanted them to. But it can also be disappointing in the sense that things are not as good as we want them to be and when they are repeatedly disappointing they become boring so we seek a break so even there is a religion for atheists and atheists also celebrate some occasions they just bring them a break from life then we talk about meaning and in the routine course of life uh, we get caught in the things that are urgent oh I have to do this job, I have to do this, I have to do that but what are the things that are truly important for us these are occasions when we are reminded of that. So there could be Independence Day. Nowadays there is Mother's Day, Father's Day. We may say this is just mundane. But yes, we live in a fragmented society and if there are some occasions where the importance of bigger things, sattvic things can be given, then it is good. So Diwali, people may not remember God, but they come together. They remember God at least a part of the day. So there is meaning. And then there is mercy. So, when we go through life, we soon understand that I am not in control. And if I am not in control, then who is? So, we have three options for that. Whoever is there, what is the acronym? PAN. So, either that is favorable, is against, or is neutral or non-existent. Now, the idea that that higher being is neutral, non-existent, that is the scientific worldview, but this is psychologically unsatisfying. It is so most people do go towards something higher, and if that whoever being higher is against us, then we are doomed. So the idea is we try to seek their blessings, we try to please that higher being. And then I talked about what the first day we discussed about the first is that there's Dhanteras, which is about Dhanvantri appearing and the universe the specific was the Devtas were given the nectar Devtas and Asuras both were given the nectar but the universal is that our health is a fundamental need that is actually not in our control and then there is wealth people pray for wealth so the union of Lakshmi and Narayan happens after the Samantra Manthan gets over so that is also signified now there are many different occasions when the union happens but the idea is Lakshmi chooses Narayan, so that is Lakshmi Puja. That is one symbolic significance of that. There are other significance also. But the idea is rather than separating material versus spiritual, that is not seek the material, seek the spiritual, we can see it as not black and white as a progression. So if a person can bring God into their life in some way, even if it is not for service, even if it is not for pure devotional service, even if service, yena kena prakare, no. So remembering that even the things that we need for our survival are actually dependent on forces beyond us can bring us humility and a certain level of devotional mentality. So we'll continue this discussion in tomorrow's session. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Is there any one question anyone has? Yes, please. Okay, good. Good question. I was going to address this tomorrow, but it's, since you brought it up, I'll address it briefly. So, it's one thing to appreciate. See, when when our vision is there, there are two very, very different things. One is appreciation and the other is adoption. So, I can appreciate and see Krishna in many things, but whether I am to adopt it, that is something which we have to be careful. So, now if somebody is celebrating Dhanteras in their homes, should we start whatever rituals are done for Dhanteras? We won't do them in our temples. 
But if of, if our family, if our relatives, if our acquaintances, they are celebrating it anyway. Now, do we go and condemn them and tell them, you know, this is all mundane. Just do worship, practice pure devotional service. Worship. That could be one way of doing it. And if we do it, that is the last time we will do it. <laughs> is it, you know? <laughs> if somebody is doing a particular puja and we condemn them for doing that puja, they will never invite us again. <laughs> now, so if somebody is doing something, we can appreciate that and help them see something Krishna conscious in it. So, if there is Ganesh Puja, for example, in Maharashtra, Ganesh Puja is very big. Sometimes we are invited to speak at Ganesh Puja. Now, we could go and tell, you know, that Alpamedhasa. <laughs> Anybody who worships a Devata is less intelligent. Yeah. Oh, that, we will be less intelligent in speaking that. Is it? We will just alienate people, antagonize people. See, that is the time when people's hearts, whatever little they, the sentiments are involved over there. But we can go and speak over there. Yes, it is Lord Ganesh who considered spiritual wisdom so important that he was ready to even sacrifice his own task so that he could write the Mahabharata. Within the Mahabharata there is the Bhagavad Gita. So, let us on this occasion, it's good to celebrate Ganesh Puja for one, for one day, for ten days, whatever. But the way we can truly express our devotion to Ganesh is by valuing the gift of wisdom that he has given to us. Let us read the Bhagavad Gita. So, we can appreciate what they are doing and connect that with Krishna. Now, does that mean we start worshipping Ganesh in our temples? No, we will not do that. So, we cannot, we cannot give up what is distinctive to our tradition. But at the same time, we don't have to be dismissive about what is not in our tradition. So, what is distinctive, we need to protect. We need to preserve. Not only protect, we need to celebrate it. We need to share it. But, what is, what is different, we should not be dismissive. So, not dismissive. That is the key point. So, now the concern is valid. Say, should devotees, for example, celebrate Shivratri? Now, we may not actually celebrate Shivratri, but we may have a talk on the occasion of Shivratri. And we may tell some pastimes of Lord Shiva in an appropriate, sensitive way. So, there are people who are anyway celebrating it. And if they can celebrate, learn more from a philosophically consistent view, that is so much better. So, my point was, let's not have a one-zero attitude. Now, that does not mean we equate zero with one. See, there is a difference between saying that there is only one zero. This is one, this is zero and there is nothing in between. There is only black and white. But the other extreme is to say there are only shades of grey and there is no such thing as black and white. Isn't it? That is not true. Isn't it? So we want to avoid both extremes. So say there is only black and white. That is one extreme. So this will be fanaticism. Mm. But to say there is only grey, there is no black and white. You know that means there is nothing which our tradition has told us and this is what we are meant to do. Then this will lead to what is called as relativism. Mm. That everything is relative. No, everything is not relative. You know, it is not that on the Shivratri instead of Hare Krishna Mahamantra we will do 16 round Japa of Om Namah Shiva. You say we want to respect Lord Shiva. Yes, we can respect Lord Shiva, but our sadhana is Hare Krishna Mantra. So, what we need to do is in between these two extremes that we appreciate that there is black and white, but so we we adopt the white, we, uh, we avoid the black. Hmm? But at the same time, wherever there is grey, we learn to appreciate and see from those shades of grey, how can we come toward Krishna? So, I will give two examples of this and conclude. So, the festival of Bhadra Purnima was not celebrated during Prabhupada's times at all. But there is not a single reference to Bhadra Purnima in Prabhupada's lectures. So, I talked about this elaborately to Vaisheshika Prabhu. Vaisheshika Prabhu is one of the main pioneers. He is one of the big uh, promoters of book distribution and he said he read about it in the Bhagavatam and devotees told him that it's a significant festival in the Indian devotees from the Indian background and now it's been promoted everywhere. 
So is that a deviation? Well, Prabhupada did not tell it, so it's a deviation. Now, Prabhupada did not tell it, but it is fulfilling the purpose of Prabhupada, isn't it? In fact, so many devotees are inspired to buy Bhagavatam, give Bhagavatam as gifts, to distribute Bhagavatam to others. So it's very auspicious. So if we stick only to the literal words of Prabhupada, there are so many opportunities which we will miss out. Is something which is in our own broader tradition, in our own Shastra it is there. There is Guru Sadhu Shastra, it may not be in Guru, but it is in Shastra. So we adopted that and not only adopted it, we made it quite mainstream now. It is a big thing. <coughs> so there is no controversy or ambiguity about this. And the other is the festival of colors. So there are to one, there's one temple in America which started that and they made it very big. They have like 50,000, 75,000 people come for the festival of colors. And they pay and come. And this devotee who started this, he, is, he started this festival in the Mormon country. Mormon is one particular branch of Christianity, which is actually a very, very conservative, very non-inclusive branch. So in that, there he started it. And in, the, there, there, in that part of America, there were no Hindus, no Indians. There is no way he could get funds. So actually to the festival of colors, people come, people actually pay to throw colors at each other. And they do kirtans over there. They have a variety of variety. It's, it's more like a fun thing. But kirtan is going on. People have prasad. People can talk with devotees. And he adopted that. So that helped him to maintain the temple. He got enough funds for the whole year. And now from him, other devotees are doing that. Now, from the Western perspective, now should in India, in the name of Holi, a lot of things happen. Should we adopt Holi as a festival? Well, we'll have to see Phale in a Parichayati. Generally speaking, there's a, the other point I was going to make is, we'll talk about this more tomorrow, that, that there is the content of what is done, there is the intent with which it is done, and there is the consequence that results from doing it. So, analysis has to consider all these three things. So from content, we could say Bhadra Purnima was not something which was uh, given by Srila Prabhupada. The consequence is what Srila Prabhupada wanted is happening. Isn't it? The books are being distributed, people are coming closer to the Bhagavatam. So that's good. Now with respect to festival of colors, the holy is a part of our broader tradition. But some of the ways in which it is celebrated, it becomes quite Rajasik or even Tamasik at times. So we don't want that. So we have to look at the fuller. So basically, to summarize three points I said, that there is a difference between appreciation and adoption. We want to appreciate, not that adopt everything. We need to know what is distinctive about our tradition, but don't dismiss something just because it's not a part of our tradition. And then when we are appreciating also, we don't mean that, we say that there is no black and white. There is, like recently one devotee sent me a picture of, you know, in Durga Puja, so they say there was Durga Puja for, it happened in Kolkata only here only that there are Durga Puja has many different themes. So there was one festival of Durga Puja, Durga Puja for LGBTQ rights. Now what has Durga Devi got to do with LGBTQ, you know, lesbians, gays and all those bisexual and all that. Now, now everybody has a right to live. We are not saying that they should be condemned. But why mix that with something religious? That is something which we will strongly disapprove of. We are not disapproving of those people in the sense of condemning them. But mixing them with something religious, that's not good. So, so there is black and white. So we, sh we shouldn't reduce everything to black and white, but we shouldn't reduce everything to shades of grey also. We need to have an understanding carefully. And in that careful understanding, I said that, how do we get that careful understanding? We look at what is being done why it is being done and what is the result of it being done and based on that we decide whether something can be appreciated or even something can be adopted or not okay so thank you very much shri prabhupada ki shri diwali mahamotsav ki nitai gaur premanande thank you very much